Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Florida Supernature. Today, we're going to be talking about spice science. My name is James Stevenson. I'm with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, the Extension Services here in Pinellas County, Florida. Coming to you today from Brooker Creek Preserve, the largest set of uh, preserved land in our tiny little urban county. We're about 9,000 acres of undeveloped upland and wetland. And our trails are open. Please do consider coming to see us soon. So we'll go ahead and get started on spice science this afternoon. So what are spices? Well, they're flavorings that come from plants, uh, from all different parts of the plants. Uh, they're not assigned to one particular thing. Uh, spices can be found in seeds, roots, bark, even flower buds, which we'll take a look at, and fruit. You might not think of fruit as being particularly spicy, but we'll have a look at some fruit that we get some very common spices from. But what are spices? Like, certainly they weren't created so that we could flavor our food. No, they are compounds that plants which are very, very good at creating, synthesizing. Perhaps you've heard the word synthesize in relation to plants. Yes, they can photosynthesize, but they can also synthesize very complex compounds uh, from elements taken from the environment. Most of these elements that plants synthesize are poisons. And we'll talk, talk a little bit about that going forward. Now, what about herbs? Why isn't this herbs and spices science? Well, spices are a bit more complex and spices allow us to talk for an hour, whereas herbs generally come from just one part of the plant, the leaves. And almost, well, I don't want to say almost exclusively, but largely from just one family of plants, the mint family. So we'll leave herbs alone for today and just focus on the science of spices. But why do we have herbs and spices? I mean, again, they're not in existence for our pleasure and for flavoring our food. Well, remember I just said that most spices and indeed most of the flavors that we get from herbs as well are poisons. Because plants are sedentary, they have no other way to defend themselves but to produce what might be toxic chemicals to whatever is trying to eat them. Here's a plant, in this case it's an oak tree, can't get up and run away. Um, it's under attack from these uh, eomoth caterpillars, which are very, if you notice these caterpillars, don't pet them, uh, they will sting you. But anyway, beside the point, Oak tree cannot get up and run away from what's trying to eat it. So plants have to put some compounds, they synthesize compounds in various parts or even all parts of their uh, bodies, if you will, roots, stems, leaves, flowers, etc., cetera, uh, to reduce the amount of uh, herbivory. Uh, that means trying not to get munched on by too many caterpillars or even by too many herbivores, higher herbivores. Now, of course, it's all a race in nature. It's all a race for the, the top. Um, plants have evolved chemicals that, pre that prevent predation. Well, the caterpillars have kept pace and can still continue to eat those, those plants that have these chemicals on board. So it, everything's always in a balance. Everything is always still developing. Um, just think of the, the milkweed analogy. Uh, that milky sap is highly toxic to most things, but the monarch and the queen caterpillars have developed a tolerance to that toxin and they can quite happily strip a um, milkweed of all of its leaves. So let's start taking a look at some of the parts of the plants that deliver us these wonderful things that we call spices. Now, a seed is probably the singularly most important product of a plant's life because a seed is going to be the next generation. 
is going to keep the population stable or growing through the seed because inside the seed, of course, is the little embryo that is going to become another plant. And the last thing that a plant would certainly want to tolerate would be for that seed to be chewed up and ground up in someone's beak or mouth and swallowed never to see the light of day ever again, never to germinate. So seeds can be a very important source of a lot of our popular spices. Here we have a seed eating bird and this bird, this in fact it's a cardinal, has this very heavy beak that's used for cracking open uh, seeds and getting that embryo out, eating the embryo, digesting the embryo, the embryo is never going to grow. So plants, many plants have had to uh, stay ahead of the seed eaters and produce chemicals that would discourage that from happening in the first place. And there's one particular family of plants, they're all related to each other, uh, called the APAC, or the, used to be called the umbelifery. Um, it's the family that includes parsley, dill, fennel, uh, cilantro, um, celery, all these things. And what characterizes this family of flowering plants is this flat topped inflorescence of tiny little white flowers. Not across the board 100%, but most members of this family have a flat topped inflorescence made of tiny little white flowers. Some have inflorescences that are more rounded and blue flowers, but for today we're going to be talking about um, some very common plants that do have this flower arrangement. Now this isn't one flower we're looking at. As I mentioned before, uh, this is actually a whole bunch of tiny little flowers. And if you look very, very closely, those flowers are very, very simple. Just little petals, little stamens, and a little uh, ovary in the center. And that ovary is what's going to ripen into the fruit with the seed inside. I know I went through that kind of quick. Join us for plant identification or botanical science for beginners, and we'll explain that a little bit further. But for today, we'll just refer to the structures that are formed by this inflorescence as its seeds. And we'll look first at a plant called anise. Perhaps you've heard of anise or um, something that is flavored with anise. Anise comes from this plant, Pimpinella. Uh, you can see its similarity to parsley. It has the divided leaf. The young leaves look similar to what? Cilantro, anybody? The flat topped white inflorescence, um, the ovary that ripens into this fruit that splits in two, um, characteristic of the family. Unique to this plant, however, are the chemicals that it combines, creates and combines for its own defense. Pimpinella uh, was first brought into cultivation, which means um, a wild plant was uh, taken into cultivation and planted and grown for a particular use, uh, for its seeds, for, it le for its leaves, for its roots, for all of the above uh, anise. First, like I said, in the Middle East. And because of the strong fragrance that comes from the seed of this plant, uh, European um, explorers uh, came across this and that strong smell, that strong flavor, uh, suggested that it might have some sort of medicinal property. You know, something that smells that strong uh, has got to do something, shouldn't it? Uh, and it was believed that anise was a carminative. Anyone know what carminative? I know you can't tell me, but do you know what carminative means? You might have time to Google it. It, it, is a substance that prevents, um, let's say, gastric discharge, gaseous, gastrous discharge, which was probably very important, um, especially um, in gatherings like church. Now, it actually does contain a compound called anethol which is not uncommon. It's uh, actually a, a compound that several different plants across several different families have actually 
uh, created into this compound by taking other elements and creating this, this organic compound called anethyl. It's found in phenyl, licorice, and star anise. Um, phenyl, licorice, and star anise are all from three different plant families. Phenyl is from this family that we're looking at here. The uh, APAC licorice is actually a legume and star anise is its own thing and we'll have a look at star anise in a bit. In the US, anise is used in jelly beans, giving it that uh, kind of licorice flavor. Uh, the UK make a confection called anise seed balls. Uh, in Italy, pizzella, and in Germany, pfeffernus. So all these European and, and um, associated countries have found a use for this plant. Uh, whether or not it had any medicinal value, it had a flavor value that um, humans enjoy and seek to add to their food. Not just food, but also liquor. Anise has found itself around the Mediterranean into several different similar, several different liqueurs that are similar in that they are all flavored with anise. And ouzo, sambuca, absinthe, raki, and arak, those are all uh, anise flavored liqueurs. Anethyl, we'll take a look at some of these compounds a little bit deeper as we go forward. Um, anethyl actually has been shown to be an antibacterial, um, a fungicide, which means it can kill fungus, and a nematicide, which means that it can kill nematodes. Now, all of these things have a benefit to the plant, don't they? Um, if you have a seed that you are investing all of this resource into and you want that seed to grow into the next generation, um, some big uh, baddies could come along like bacteria to cause an infection that might kill the seedlings. Fungus are very good at wiping out little seedlings. I don't know if we have any gardeners with us today, but as you know, there's a lot of um, fungal pests of plants and nematodes as well. So it's almost like this plant is instilling a little bit of protection for the developing embryo. So these compounds can prevent the seeds from being eaten by acting as a poison or that kind of deterrent, or the compounds and or the compounds can impart some sort of benefit onto the plant itself. Another member of this family, again, we have the flat topped inflorescence of tiny little white flowers. This one has much more divided leaves. This is in the genus Carum and this is caraway. This is a plant that's found kind of around the Mediterranean, uh, Western Asia, Europe, and North Africa. It contains carvone, limonene, and our friend anethole. And we know that anethole has those antimicrobial um, characteristics. Uh, caraway has its own. Uh, carvone has been used by humans as a flavoring, obviously, the, the caraway flavor. Uh, it's used uh, industrially in air fresheners. Uh, it has been found to be a good natural potato preservative. And again, that might be down to the fact that it could have an antimicrobial activity as well to keep the potatoes from rotting. Um, and it's also being investigated as a potential natural mosquito repellent. Now, what we have to find out, um, it's shown very promising uh, activity as a mosquito repellent. Uh, the studies that have to go on now are whether or not uh, it's toxic to the person who applies that repellent to. So those studies have yet to be done or in their, they're in the process of being done. Limonene has been used industrial as a, in, in cleaning agents uh, as a solvent. Limonene, as you might guess, uh, has a bit of a lemon flavor. And again, we have our friend anethol, the antimicrobial, which also might be an insect repellent. All these things, of course, imparting a benefit to the plant itself. In the US, we don't really get too carried away with caraway. It's found in rye bread primarily. Um, in Europe, of course, uh, in sauerkraut, you'll see the caraway seeds in sauerkraut. There's actually a, a caraway seed cake. Uh, in the Middle East, um, 
There's a pudding, which is a type of dessert, of course. Harissa, if you haven't tried harissa, it's a very wonderful hot sauce um, that contains a very complex, um, has a very complex flavor, uh, lots of different layers. The, the base, of course, is pepper, uh, hot peppers, and then some uh, lovely other aromatics added to that. The number one supplier in the world, little old Finland. How about that? Go Finland. Next up in this family, this umbellifery or APAC family, again, gonna say it again, little flat topped inflorescence. It's called the umbellifery uh, because the flower is, the inflorescence is referred to as an umbel, uh, the same root as umbrella. So we have celery, apium, graviolins means very highly scented. And we know that celery seeds are uh, an, a, an, Im an important component in some of our spice blends. Um, it has, it's been around forever. It is still, you can still find wild celery growing in the hills uh, around the Mediterranean area. Seeds of celery were found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. It is mentioned in the Iliad. Um, it's critical in making a good Bloody Mary. Uh, found in Chicago hot dogs and good old Old Bay seasoning. Celery is important in um, Ayurvedic medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, and it is used uh, for these conditions, water retention, arthritis, lowering blood pressure, and again is this mosquito repellent, uh, but celery in the West has been taken and used as an um, as a component for perfume. So look at all the stuff that we're taking away from plants. Um, they're just trying to stay alive. They're just trying to you know, reproduce and, and give their offspring the best chance in the world and we're slathering it on so we can smell good. Coriander, another member of this family, the APAC or umbellifery. Anybody know what the, uh, we, we talk about coriander seeds, but does anyone know what the coriander leaves are referred to? Cilantro, same plant, same genus, Coriandrum sativum. Some plants are cultivated because they produce very large and abundant seeds, and some plants are cultivated, uh, they've been selected to have uh, more abundant and larger leaves, and the seeds aren't quite as important. So there, there are two different crops that are derived from the same species, Coriandrum sativum. Some of the compounds that uh, this species produces include linalool or linalol, uh, pinene, pinene, of course, uh, having the uh, fragrance and flavor of pine. Uh, it has corian coriander, has a nutty, spicy citrus flavor, uh, but this plant also produces aldehydes, which are soap. Um, a certain percentage of the population is genetically predisposed to sense aldehyde in cilantro. And they're the ones that can't understand why anyone would ever eat the stuff because it simply tastes like soap. That's because those people have the genetic propensity to be able to detect the aldehyde uh, where others do not have that ability. And instead it tastes lovely and fresh and green. Again, another one of these um, Mediterranean, Middle Eastern plants can still be found growing in the wild. The plants in cultivation have been selected for, like I mentioned before, the larger seeds, the, the larger foliage, but you can still find the wild plant growing. This is another one that was very widely used um, very, very long ago. Another one that was found in Tut's tomb. Uh, you'll find coriander seed ground up in Asian curries, uh, you'll find the seeds kind of whole in European pickles. And coriander is actually used to flavor the wheat beers, the vice beers um, in Belgium. And perhaps the next time you have one, you'll be able to pick up on that coriander flavor. Cumin, cuminum, cyminum, uh, doesn't look quite like the others, but if you squint, you'll see that flat topped inflorescence. The leaves are very, very, very finely divided probably the most finely divided. Uh, they look like individual little hairs. Cumin, 
also produces an elongated seed like we've seen before. The characteristics of the, of the family are they're very similar. Um, this one is another Middle Eastern. Um, the seeds were found in an in a ancient, ancient archaeological uh, find from 2000 BC, 4,000 years ago. Uh, another one of the compounds that we've taken from this plant and put it on our bodies to smell good. It has the cymine and terpenes that we've mentioned before. It's found throughout um, in Europe, in India, it's used in everything, cumin powder. Uh, it's one of the base um, brought to the US by the Spanish and found its way into Tex-Mex chilies. So cumin is a very important compound um, in, in Tex-Mex chilies as this plant came to the United States or to North America, I should say, um, by the Spanish and the Portuguese. I think at this point I'd like to mention that we've seen these, uh, we're gonna fin we're finishing up with this family and all the different seeds that we get from these families. Uh, but all these compounds that these plants are producing, these antimicrobials, these antifungals, antibacterials, um, those play a very big role in food preservation, especially in warmer climates. So think about uh, in, the, in India, where the climate is very warm, very muggy, uh, food preservation would be very, very important. And so discovering that these plants and the seeds of these plants that are found growing around or are traded from other parts of the world actually impart some sort of preservation due to their antimicrobial, antifungal, antibacterial uh, function. Um, one of the reasons that these are added to the foods, not just for flavor. Um, we happen to end up with these complex flavors because so many of these compounds are added, but in these warmer climates, these are much more important, if you will, to include in cooking, in foods. Whereas in colder climates, Northern Europe, uh, food preservation isn't such of a problem because of the colder temperatures. Only during certain times of the year could food go off. So Northern latitudes, the cuisines just simply by nature tend not to be very spicy at all um, because the spices weren't integral to the preservation of the food. Does that make sense? Um, and it also shows why um, as humans began to move these spices around, there was a little bit of maybe distrust or distaste uh, for various of these flavors. They weren't a part of the in, uh, indigenous, I wanna say, cuisine of a, a particular area. And um, there are still some spices that are taking a little bit of time to get traction in uh, Western culture uh, from the East. Now we've got another seed, the seed of the giant nutmeg tree. And Maristica fragrans is the name of this genus, this species. Uh, the seed is actually encased in this fleshy material. This is the fruit itself. We've got the husk. Then we have this fleshy material that surrounds the seed itself. Uh, that fleshy material is also used as a spice but the seed itself is ground up into what we know as nutmeg. Um, originally from the Spice Islands in Indonesia, uh, that, that pulp that surrounds the seed itself is referred to as mace. And you know you can actually purchase mace as a separate spice, and it does have a very mild nutmeg flavor. This one, this seed contains that pinene that we mentioned before, limonene, which we've met before, and this meristocin is a straight up poison. Um, there is such a thing as um, nutmeg poisoning. Uh, so this is one where the seed is really trying not to be eaten, uh, discouraging anyone who's ever eaten a nutmeg seed to maybe not do that again. Um, it was a very uh, widely traded, very valuable and rare. Um, it, this plant was believed to in compound with other aromatic spices 
to have an effect on the plague. And so um, lots of money and lots of lives, lots of treasure was sent on the open oceans to bring this, these seeds back to try and put a halt to the plague in the 17th century. Uh, there was a terrible, there is a terrible story of um, a massacre, the, um, the Dutch East India Company who had the most control over the trade on, of this spice, um, decided it wouldn't do business with the uh, indigenous peoples on the islands where it grew, so they just killed them all. Yeah, ugly stuff. Uh, the Brits then came in and had more, um, and strong-armed the Dutch, and they moved the trees into the islands, the tropical islands of the British Empire. Although it has been used widely medicinally because it has that, that toxicity and, you know, what you want to do is uh, poison your uh, uh, oppressive, the oppressive agent, the bacteria, the fungus, whatever is causing you distress, uh, but there haven't been any um, definitive uh, studies on any medicinal effectiveness of nutmeg. It doesn't mean that um, it isn't still used um, as a medicinal. Uh, just because it hasn't been proven doesn't mean that it doesn't work, of course, uh, but um, some folks just can't help themselves and they kind of intentionally take too much nutmeg uh, just to get, you know, loopy, you know, right on the edge of Passing out, how much fun is that? I, I don't know. Anyway, all kind of uses throughout the world. In Indonesia, nutmeg is not a, a, a sweet like we use here in the US and in Europe. We put it in puddings and eggnog. eggnog. It's a, a topping for desserts. Uh, in Indonesia, it's used in savory dishes. Um, in India itself, nutmeg is smoked. Not smoked like, not smoked like smoking ribs or a ham or something like that, but like put in a, in a cigarette and smoked. Go figure. People, um, moving on to roots. Uh, we get some spices from roots of plants, maybe not uh, immediately obvious, but here's our spokes root. We'll call this one a root, even though it's an underground stem. We won't split hairs, not today. That's a different class for a different time. But anyway, underground, we'll call it a root. Uh, the ginger root. And of course, everyone must be familiar with ginger, like it or not. Uh, it does have a, a really nice, uh, fresh, lemony, spicy uh, aroma. It's found throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, the family that this one belongs to, the Zingiberaceae, has other fragrant uh, members of the family. Turmeric comes from this family. Cardamom, you might have heard of. We'll look at that a little bit later. And galangal, which is kind of the Thai, um, the, the ginger that's flavored in Thai dishes. They all have a, a little bit of similar flavor compounds. Um, it's been around for quite a long time. India is currently the world producer. And the compound, uh, this, this um, antimicrobial compound is known as zingerone. It's everywhere in Asian cuisine, of course. You start with garlic and ginger and off you go. Uh, in the Caribbean, this plant was taken and fermented into delicious ginger beer, but it is hot, hot, hot. Um, in Europe, it's found its way mostly into sweets, uh, like chewing gum, that sort of thing, or gingerbread, of course. Uh, ginger is one spice that's quite easy, like incredibly easy to grow on your own. We'd recommend growing it in a, in a large pot. Uh, if you put it in the ground, you might have much more ginger than you're gonna be able to eat your way out of. Uh, growing it in a container, just get a, get a hand, it's referred to as a hand of ginger from a produce stand. Um, plant it sideways in a large pot of potting soil cover it about an inch or two with potting soil and leave it. It's gonna rest for a little while, but eventually 
the little growing tips of this underground stem are going to produce leaves that poke through the ground um, and continue to branch and grow and branch and grow. So when you need a little piece of ginger, like maybe a thumb sized piece, you can just reach down into the pot, break off a piece, peel it, take the leaves off and off you go. Fresh ginger is arguably much, much flavor, more flavorful uh, than anything that you would buy at the grocery store that's been dried. Now, the allium, the garlic, allium sativum, allium is a very large genus that includes the onions, the shallots, the leeks, you know, this is the onion family, but garlic has quanti qualities in and of itself uh, that make it very popular and also very unpopular. This again uh, is an underground uh, storage device. Technically, these are fat leaves, but for today, we'll just refer to this as a root because it comes from underground. Um, there are lots and lots of wild alliums. Um, we're not quite sure uh, from which species this was taken into cultivation, if the species is even around today. It might have died out in the wild and is only known in cultivation. Um, this is another one the Egyptians knew of. Um, the, the British didn't like this one. Um, you know, it has some qualities that some people don't find um, very pleasant, as it were. Uh, it had, um, and that attitude kind of came back to America. And um, like my parents' generation, they're still not too keen on too much garlic, whereas um, younger generations, much more experimental, perhaps in their in their uh, gastronomic endeavors, might have a higher tolerance to the garlic flavor. Being so strong, having such a strong um, flavor, odor, um, its ability to get in your blood and come out in your breath. Um, obviously, this is a plant that was used very much medicinally. We haven't we. Uh, haven't yet uh, found any biological activity uh, from any of the constituents of garlic, but of course it has been used and people will swear by it, so go right ahead. Um, this stuff, owl methyl sulfide, um, these sulfides are quite common in the allium group of plants, the onions and the garlics and the shallots. Um, and those are defensive chemicals. Uh, this particular sulfide um, is the one that actually can cross into your blood through your digestive system. And garlic breath isn't just because you've been chewing it. Garlic breath is actually coming out of your lungs. It's coming out of your blood. Um, like it or not, that's what's happening. Moving on to bark. Um, Bark, who eats bark? We all eat bark. Well, a lot of us eat bark. Uh, the cinnamon is the most popular of the bark derived spices. Uh, Cinnamomum is the genus and several different species uh, contribute to this, the quote unquote same spice known as cinnamon. There's three main types. There's the one that's referred to as cassia very often or the Chinese cinnamon. It's the one that looks the most like bark. And this is available obviously in Asian markets, dried of course. Um, Chinese cinnamon, uh, this is the one that is most likely to be ground into the powder that we buy from the shops. Um, the major spice brands uh, use this one. It's perhaps the, the cheapest to produce, the cheapest to purchase, um, and is ground in that very, very fine powder that we can purchase and add to a lot of the thing, a lot of our, our cooking in, in at least the Southeast US. Next up in quality uh, is the Indonesian. And this is the one, if you purchase cinnamon sticks, you're purchasing Indonesian cinnamon. Uh, this is most often used uh, here in this country, uh, 
as a flavoring that you add to a dish and then take the whole stick out. Um, sometimes, of course, used in you know hot cider, you can put a cinnamon stick in. It's used in decorations and so on. It's the cinnamon stick, the Indonesian cinnamon, Bermanii. The tastiest, the most flavorful, the most sought after, and therefore the most expensive is the Sri Lankan cinnamon um, and fresh salant or yeah, not really old salant, uh, Sri Lankan cinnamon. Uh, this you can use in cooking yourself with a, with a coffee grinder. You can take this, break it up into little bits in the coffee grinder into a fine powder. Uh, this is going to be the, the, the tip top cinnamon. The, the, you're gonna win the bake off if you use the Sri Lankan cinnamon. That's not a promise, but it's something to pursue. Anyway, more about cinnamon. It's been around forever, um, but it was a secret. It came from the, the Far East and the, of course the Westerners wanted to know what the source was because they were having to pay a lot for it. They want to know where it's, where it's growing so we can go and wipe out those indigenous people and take it for ourselves. But thankfully the secret was kept and um, it stayed a staple of the spice trade from the Far East. Uh, the active ingredient, cinnamaldehyde, again, an antimicrobial and cinnamon with its heat um, and strong flavor uh, has been used traditionally uh, as a warming agent in traditional medicines. We have a couple of flower buds before we get to the fruit. We'll end up with the fruit today, but we have a few flower buds to look at first, believe it or not. Leave it to humans to find use for every single thing. Uh, capers, if you've had capers, those are the flower buds of a small, of medium-sized shrub uh, that grows in the Mediterranean. Again, this was thought to be a carminative. If you weren't with us at the beginning, we discussed what carminative means. Um, it prevents um, gaseous in, intestinal discharge. Um, caper is a flower bud and it has mustard oil. And of course, mustard, very, very sharp, very, very acrid. You can see if, if we weren't so big that that might be a deterrent, might not taste so great. But it's a flavoring, of course, that we've, that's found its way into various different um, uh, cuisines, not every day, and maybe not everyone has even heard of capers or certainly not worked with them or added them to a dish that they prepare. But you will find it in things like tartar sauce. Uh, if you do get salmon, uh, if we ever get back to restaurants, um, they might be uh, scattered with some of these, these capers. Caper berries, a different species, where the flower bud is much, much larger. It's something that you kind of almost have to cut in half. I was interested, I visited um, the old city in Jerusalem and I, I saw these plants growing um, in between these enormous stones of the old city of Jerusalem. And I asked somebody, what are they? You know, what plant can grow in such extreme conditions? And I was told that these were capers. So. Here's a plant. These guys aren't really paying attention to the plant. I was. Um, but this plant's flower buds are the capers that, when pickled, can be added to dishes to add that nice peppery, mustardy flavor. Clove is another flower bud. Uh, and if you look closely, you can see the little stalk and the little flower bud leaves that surround the bud, and then the little what was going to be a flower uh, before was harvested, before the flower even opened. Sigium is the name of this genus. Um, it's another one of the um, tropical spices that have that um, antimicrobial activity. So although we associate it with a certain uh, family of spices, kind of the cinnamon, clove, nutmeg, the kind of quote unquote holiday spices, um, the dreaded pumpkin spice, of course. So clove is how we associate, but of course it was used initially, uh, not only to flavor, but because it was observed to have these uh, antimicrobial activities. 
you can still get um, clove cigarettes. They're, I uh, believe, if I remember correctly, whoops, um, high school, um, Jakarta actually had a participant at this presentation say that her husband um, cured himself of some horrible disease, uh, and he swears it was from smoking these clove cigarettes. So maybe not something your doctor would recommend, but there's all kinds of ways to be. Now we'll finish up with fruit, and of course, excuse me, fruit is not something that we often associate with spices because fruit is sweet and juicy, right? Well, fruit is a botanical term first and foremost, and it refers to any ripened ovary containing the seeds. So anything with seeds in it is a fruit, technically, botanically speaking. Um, so a fruit isn't always a juicy, wonderful thing. Fruits can be dry. Here is a dry fruit. When star anise is ripe and when the seeds are ripe and ready to be shed, uh, the fruit dries up and splits along these little lines so that the shiny, smooth seeds can pop out and grow into another anise, anise shrub. So this is technically a fruit because it's a ripened ovary with the seeds inside. And star anise is an Asian. Uh, we do have a species native to the Southeast US, but it's not grown commercially for its, for its fruit. Uh, that would be the star anise that's grown for its fruit. I found it very interesting that 90% of the harvested fruit of the star anise plant, 90% worldwide, is used now uh, to make Tamiflu, um, a, a very powerful and important uh, tool to be used against the spread of flu. This is a plant that's very, very ancient. It represents among the first of the flowering plants, the very, very basal flowering plants. Uh, but look, it managed to create our friend Anethol that we met in the very first plant. Um, so widely separated in time, widely different families, but being these great synthesizers, anethol has been produced by this plant. It's actually cheaper to grow star anise than anise itself, the, the true little annual plant um, that grows and produces seeds and dies every year. The star anise is a perennial evergreen shrub that can produce a crop of fruit year after year. It's used around the East. Um, it's one of the key ingredients to pho, which is a very popular noodle dish right now. Uh, it's one of the five spices. Um, sometimes you can find um, coffee with star anise in, in the, in the Middle East in particular. Another fruit would be the fruit or what some people might refer to as the seed pod. Uh, seed pod is what um, normal people would refer to as a dry fruit, perhaps, as a seed pod, but it's technically a fruit uh, of cardamom. Cardamom is one of those um, ginger relatives, uh, and it has a leaf and a flower very similar to the ginger plant, but it's in its own little uh, genus, Elateria. Again, it's a tropical, so you can expect it's going to have uh, those antimicrobial properties, one of the reasons that it has been brought into cultivation because it helps preserve food for longer. Um, it's originally from India and Indonesia, but now um, Guatemala is the number one world producer, uh, thanks to a German coffee grower who um, decided that he would put some of his land aside to grow this uh, interesting uh, spice, can be relatively easily collected or easily grown anyway. Collecting and processing takes a little bit more time and the collecting and the processing is what le leads this plant to be one of the most expensive. So if you've got some cardamom pods, put them in the refrigerator to, to keep them fresher longer. They're worth something. The flavor of cardamom, if you're not familiar with it, uh, minty citrusy, uh, it has Again, compounds that we've met before, the antimicrobials. There's one called menthone, uh, 
you can hear uh, the root of that kind of menthol. Um, it's an Asian, it's an Asian and Indian spice. Um, but interestingly, um, you can find several um, baked goods in uh, Northern Europe uh, that use cardamom quite a lot. It's another, and another in the Middle East that you can find as a coffee flavoring. And look, apparently it can neutralize the toughest breath odors. So get in there and chew on some cardamom if you've been eating garlic and you've got garlic in your bloodstream. Just a suggestion, not a command. Our penultimate fruit that we'll be looking at this afternoon, the chili pepper. And of course, now that you know, now that you're botanists and you know that a fruit is a ripened ovary with seeds inside, we know that chili peppers have got seeds inside, which makes it technically a fruit. Uh, there's a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of different chili pepper cultivars. They're native to the new world. So although a lot of, um, a lot of world cuisines, um, Italy, Southeast Asia, of course, China, uh, have peppers in their, uh, in their mix, in their, in their cuisines. It's only since the Spanish went into Central and South America, Mexico in particular, uh, and stole all their stuff and sent them around the world, uh, did the pepper as a spice come into, um, oh, and also as a fruit, the green and red peppers, all these things native to, to Chile excuse me, native to Central and South America. Um, this is in the family of plants native to the Central and South America. Potatoes, eggplants, tobacco, and coca. All these things were kind of new on the scene. Now, there is a theory that uh, peppers got to the Far East via the Pacific. It's a bit of a stretch, but it's possible because there were some pretty long voyages done even before the Europeans got to the quote unquote new world. So it is a possibility that they might've been established before. Capsaicin is the stuff that uh, binds to pain receptors. It's pepper spray. Speaking of pain receptors, gotta have a set. <clears throat> So capsaicin is one of these compounds that the plant has created to prevent anything from ever chewing up its seeds. Because if you chew up the seeds, they'll never germinate because they've been ground up by your giant teeth. And here we go, taking that defense mechanism and seeing how much we can intensify that and seeing how much we can tolerate it. So it's just a silly thing that humans have done with one of these plant survival mechanisms. And we'll finish up because my voice is finishing up today with our last fruit. Uh, and yes, black pepper, peppercorn is a fruit because remember why? What's the definition of a fruit? Yes, it's a ripened ovary with seed inside. And a peppercorn is just that. The pepper plant produces these long wands of tiny little white flowers. And each flower has that magic organ called an ovary. And after fertilization, after pollination, the ovary swells and the embryo inside is provided some food. And that is what a fruit is. In the case of black pepper, the fruit again is dry. The seed inside is very, very large and the skin is very thin. The black peppercorn is when you just pick the fruit, dry it with that thin uh, sk membrane skin on the outside and the large white seed on the inside. Um, so the black peppercorn is just the dried fruit as it would come off the plant. If that skin is removed and the white seed inside is revealed, you get what we call white pepper. So it's the same plant, uh, but the compounds that would normally be found in black pepper when you grind it up from the skin are missing in white pepper because it's just the seed. And finally, the green pepper, 
uh, is just the unripe fruit. So before the fruit ripens, you can pick it off the plant, and that is what we call a green pepper. Um, if you were with us on Monday for invasive plants, and if you join us again next week for invasive plants, um, you will know or you will learn that the pink pepper is actually the fruit of Brazilian pepper tree, that terrible weed that we spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on every year trying to eradicate. But black pepper, um, again, one of these that has been known forever and ever and ever, for some reason, no, for a reason known very well to the ancient Egyptians, uh, Ramses, when his mummy was examined, <clears throat> had peppercorns up his nose, for I'm sure a very good reason. Uh, pepper was once uh, used as currency, because again, this is one that came from tropical areas, not very easily cultivated or able to be cultivated at all in, in temperate Europe. Uh, piperine is the active ingredient. Um, we haven't found any bioactive um, mechanisms quite yet, but again, it's being studied. Uh, it's been used quite a lot, even if it's just to make you sneeze, right? So to sum up, spices basically represent plant defense chemicals. Uh, these are compounds that plants as ultimate synthesizers uh, have created for their own uses uh, as antifungal, antibacterial, uh, to, to prevent being eaten, um, produced throughout plant tissues. We looked at seeds, we looked at fruit, we looked at roots, we looked at flower buds. Um, spices are more complex and certainly more spices come from warmer climates because of those antifungal and antibacterial properties that help to um, preserve foods. So that's a little bit about spice science for today. I hope I held your attention and that you got something out of today. Um, <clears throat> I guess the takeaway message from the extension services um, as far as the importance of spices in your life is that spice can help reduce the amount of other additives that you might put in your food, such as salt. Um, consider using spices to flavor your food instead of salt for your health. Um, a lot of these spices have purported medicinal properties. Uh, they certainly can't hurt you. Uh, these spices that are produced uh, for for culinary use. So experiment. See how many. See what kind of spices you can add in your um, kit. And finally, to preserve spices, keep them someplace dark and cool and dry. Now, most people have a spice rack that's where right over the stove, the, op the opposite of dark and cool and dry. Make yourself a nice little container to keep your spices in and the refrigerator and they'll last much, much longer. More than three years, no bueno. Uh, time to replace those spices and grind your own. Get yourself a, a coffee grinder that is used exclusively to grind your own fresh spices and you'll see a tremendous difference. So just a few things that'll help you hopefully experiment with some spices in your life. I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or complaints or suggestions, please feel free to email me at my pinellascounty.org address or at the address right here under my name, uh, the UF address. I check both of those um, relatively regularly. Uh, next week, Florida Supernature will come to you Wednesday at two o'clock and we'll be talking about invasive plants in Pinellas County. Today's presentation will be recorded uh, and all of our Florida Supernature presentations have been recorded. Subtitles have been added and you can find them on our YouTube channel, UF space slash space IFAS extension Pinellas County. I'll leave this slide up for just a few more seconds. Thank you so much again for joining us today. James Stevenson with the University of Florida, 
IFIS Extension Services in Pinellas County.